you're looking at us online. Uh, my name is Hilary and I'm just giving the people who are here in the village hall a quick rundown of what we need to do. You'll notice you're all beautifully. Um, and we just want you to remember that there is a one-way system in this hall. Uh, if you need to go into the back hall, please can you use the entrance through the kitchen and then come back into this hall through the side. Uh, it is signed. But uh, we welcome you and uh, I'll hand over now to Stephen. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen, as Hilary has just said, and I shall be leading the first part of the service, during which we have a children's quiz. Yay! So, children, are you lively and awake this morning? Yes. Yeah. yeah? That's great. Well, it's been a long time since we last met together. We've been um, meeting online, so to speak, for far longer than we've been meeting together in this building. So it is great to be uh, together once again this morning. And I'd like just to read three verses from Psalm 34, which reminds us why we gather in this way together, whether we are physically in the same building or watching online. Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord, let the afflicted hear and rejoice. And here's the bit. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And that's what we're going to do as we sing our first song. It's a, a call to worship Jesus as the giver of life, as the prince of life. So we're going to have our first song now. Who paints the skies? Who paints the skies into glorious day? Only the splendor of Jesus who breathes his light to fists of clay Only the splendor of Jesus Who shapes the valleys and brings the rain Only the splendor of Jesus Who makes the desert to live again Only the splendor of Jesus Teach every nation Teach every nation His marvelous way Each generation shall sing his praise. He is wonderful, he is glorious, clothed in righteousness, full of tenderness. Come and worship him, he's the prince of life, he will cleanse our hearts in his river. the cry of the barren one, only the mercy of Jesus, who breaks the curse of the heart of stone, only the mercy of Jesus, who stones the prison and sets men free, yes, only the mercy of Jesus, purchasing souls for eternity, only Every nation his mother's way. Each generation shall sing his praise. Yeah. He is wonderful, he is glorious, clothed in righteousness, full of tenderness. Come and worship him, he's the prince of life, he will cleanse us. Right. 
together. Lord, we thank you that we are gathered together in this building this morning once again as a small part of your worldwide family, gathering together as your people, gathering together to hear your word to us this morning. And Lord, we thank you that we can do this. And Father, as we are here together, um, whether remotely, online, in our homes, we're in this building, we pray, Lord, that you would draw close to us, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would challenge us, that you would guide us, and that you would encourage us, Lord, for the week ahead. And Lord, for those who are not here in person today, we pray, Lord, that together with them, we would feel very much as one body together with you, Lord Jesus, standing in our midst. And Lord, we thank you for keeping us safe during the lockdown period. And Lord, we just pray that you would intervene in a mighty way to bring an end to the immense suffering and hardship that this awful virus has caused to so many people. But our great prayer, Lord, is that your splendor and your righteousness and your glory and your tenderness would speak into the lives of people in our day, that they would come and worship you. Lord, be merciful in our nation this day, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Right, this is the moment the children have been waiting for, I hope. <clears throat> How are you feeling this morning, children? I, good? Well, we've got a little quiz now, and it's not just restricted to the children, because we're all children at heart. And what we're going to do is just think a little bit about what's happened over the weeks that we haven't been able to meet as a church. What's been going on in the lives of this country and in our individual lives? So first question, and importantly, there are some prizes up on the radiators here. And if you get the right answer, you can come and select a, a prize. Just choose what you want and, and then go back to your seat. So first question. Who knows how many weeks it has been since we last met here as a church? Now, I will accept the nearest... Yes, Lauren? Bang on. Well done. Come and collect your prize. Next question. If it's 20 weeks, how many days is that? You've got to be quick. Is that Daniel with his hand up? Daniel. How many days is that? Eight. I'm going to have to go for something a little bit closer. Anyone else? 20 weeks. How many days is that? Who's, who knows their times table? Peter, come and help yourself to the sweet. How many hours is that? Come on, there must be some mathematicians here. 140 days, how many hours? Yes, Jacob. Did you say 3,000? I'm going to give you that. You're only, you're only 360 out, so come and have a prize. 3,360, well done. There we've got a budding mathematician in our midst. 
Okay. Now, how much do you think your hair has grown in that time, in the 20 weeks? Show me with your hands. How long do you think it's, it grows in 20 weeks? Hillary, do that again. I think that's about right. It's six inches. Six, sorry, six centimetres. Six centimetres. Well done. Hair generally grows about three millimetres a week. So... For those of you who um, are not converted to metric yet, that works out at 2.3 inches or 6 centimetres. And during the lockdown, I was lucky enough, as you can see, to have my hair cut by Sarah. Now, Sarah is quite a professional at this. She would get my razor and go... <laughs> but she wouldn't let me do the same for her. <laughs> so, has anyone else here had their hair cut by a member of their family, their brother or sister. Terry, tell us about your hair cutting. <laughs> Who's been cutting your hair? Uh, no. Nell. Yeah. Come and help yourself to a, a sweet. <laughs> <laughs> now, some people have tried to cut their own hair with interesting results. It's hard to cut straight unless you've got something to assist you, like this may be. That's all right, Marcus. <laughs> Does anyone know what we call that style of haircut? Put, Evelyn, you were first, come and get your prize. A pudding basin a pudding, or a pudding bowl haircut. And of course, some of the results are pretty horrendous. If you go to the next slide, Marcus. I, uh, one before that. Is there one between or not? No, no okay. It's gone missing somewhere. Never mind. Now, because we couldn't go to the park, we couldn't go to the cinema, we couldn't meet our friends, a lot of people have started new hobbies or learnt a new skill. Has anyone done anything like that here? Has anyone perhaps started a, a new sport or started oh, playing an instrument? Jacob and Daniel together, simultaneous, what have you been up to? You went... Have you got home cinema? No, I, uh, I play football. You play football. Well done, lads. You can both come up and collect uh, some sweets. That's very good. Well, a lot of people, believe it or not, have started baking more. Hands up if you know what the most popular recipe is that people have been baking during lockdown. Sorry. Lemon drizzle. lemon drizzle said Terry. No, not lemon drizzle. The most popular cake, Lauren. It's banana bread. Lauren, I'm, Lauren got in just before you here. Well done, Lauren. It's banana cake or banana bread. Now, we've been able to meet together without actually leaving our homes during the lockdown period. And there was, this is a multi-choice multi question, okay? So don't jump at the first answer. What has been the technology called that has allowed us to meet together and talk together and see one another online during this lockdown? Was it called Boom? Was it called Gloom? Or was it called Zoom? Jacob had his hand up before the last questions. Jacob, what do you think it was? Zoom. And well done for preempting the question. Excellent. Come and get another packet of sweets. It was Zoom, wasn't it? 
<clears throat> now, tell me, who is this man who became famous during the lockdown? Well done, Terry. You're obviously hungry this morning. <laughs> Captain Tom Moore. What did he do? What did he become famous for doing? Yes, Nathan. Absolutely. He walked a hundred laps of his garden. Come and help yourself. Well done. Now, how old, this is a more difficult one, how old was he when he started to walk around his garden? Oh, Evelyn. That was Evelyn, well done, 99 years old. And what was his ambition? When he... What was his ambition to do before he was 100? Before he was 100. Well done, Bridget. Come and collect your prize. How much has he raised for NHS charities? Bridget, take a second packet while you're up. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually 32 million. And what special thing happened to him on July the 17th? Peter. He was knighted by the Queen. He was knighted by the Queen. Well done. Come and help yourself. And does anyone know the funny thing he said as he prepared to meet the Queen? Not quite. He, he, well, I'm being harsh. If I kneel down, I won't be able to get up. Well done, Evelyn. <laughs> and because during this lockdown period, the towns were so quiet and the roads were quiet, we all became a bit more aware of the animal life around us, like the birds in the garden. And in some places, the animals made the most of this, and they thought they would take to the roads and to the towns themselves. What are these animals, boys and girls? They're taking a day trip to a town in Israel. What are they? Wild Well done, Hill. Well done. Well, what about these animals? Next slide. Nathan. Goats. Goats. Now, you can't actually see it, but there's a shop here. It's got a lovely name. You felty thing. You spelled E W E. <laughs> it's a little town in Wales where the sheep are go or the goats are going out for lunch. And finally, what about these animals? Oh, can you see them? Yes, Nathan. They're monkeys. And they were, there were hordes of them in Thailand. And do you know what they were up to? Did anyone see them on the news? There were rival gangs of these macaques, monkeys, fighting one another. They were vying for position in the town. Well, well done. Um, this lockdown situation has been a real, really strange time for all of us, hasn't it? And it's been a very sad time as well for many people um, who have been ill or no friends or relatives who have been ill. People who haven't been able to see the people they love. Your children, you haven't been able to go to school. And we haven't been able to do the things that we are used to doing, including meeting here as we are this morning. And although we're here together this morning, it is a bit odd, isn't it? But the great thing is that as a Christian, we have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the thing about that relationship is nothing can get in the way of it. Wherever we are and whatever we're doing, whatever is happening around us, whether it's good, bad, happy or sad, Jesus promises that he is always with us and he always hears us when we talk to him. And if we are his children and he is our heavenly father, there is a remarkable thing that we're told in the Bible. 
And we don't know, we don't understand it quite, but what, the, the thing is, whatever happens to us in this life, ultimately is for our good. And that's something very precious to hang on to at these times. So thank you for listening. And we're now going to sing, it's a very energetic song actually. It's a children's song, King of Me. Can we do the actions? We can't, no. So let's just uh, sit in our seats and enjoy. you've been watching this chat over the past 18 weeks, you got me instead this morning. <laughs> so, there we are. Well, we're, gonna, we're back to Revelation today, which is good. So I'm just going to read Revelation chapter 4, and then I'll have a short prayer together before Peter comes and expounds on that. So it's Revelation 4, the throne in heaven. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Well, we thank God for that passage of Scripture. Let's just turn to our Heavenly Father again in prayer. Father, we thank you that once again we have been able to meet here, several of us, physically this morning. We thank you, Father, that what has been going on as Stephen has been reminding us again, has been going on under your gaze. But we thank you, Lord, that you are in heaven. You're on this throne that we've been reading about now, and you are there permanently. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are there. We are down here. We have to put up with so many things, Lord, in our lives. And we do pray and thank you that all that's happened over the past 20 weeks, as Lord, uh, you've seen it all. And we just pray that you will be with us now as we have entered here to not, not only read your word, not only sing and see these songs that we've had this morning, but also we're here to, 
take on board the word of God, what it's saying to us. And we do pray, Lord, that as Peter comes and brings this message to us, very soon after the next song, we pray that you will really bless us together and that we may go away from this place realizing that we have really met with the Heavenly Father, our God who is in heaven and who is dwelling among us even now, Lord. We thank you that you are among us and that we know your presence and we pray that you will send your spirit down upon us even now and pray that those, uh, as Peter is speaking and we are listening, may your Holy Spirit fill our minds and our hearts and our souls and invigorate us, Lord, so that in due time we may be able to radiate around here at Biddending in the many homes around us the love of Christ and how he has really helped us and that we may be able to put out the gospel of him so that people will understand and know him more, particularly in this day and age in which we're living, Lord. We thank you, though, that many people have been glued to the online services and have listened so much to what's been saying all over this country, all over the world. And we do pray, Lord, that even those that have been listening to us may indeed come along and join us in the days ahead, if it is your will, that we may yet see our fellowship here built up and blessed, we pray. We do bring to you, Lord, those that have been uh, sadly uh, in, at home and many of them have been uh, struggling because of what's going on. We do think and we do bring to you this morning our brother Douglas, Lord, and, and his wife Pat, and we thank you for Sarah here this morning as they've been looking after him. Lord, reach out to him, Lord. Maybe we, uh, as human beings, can't communicate with him too well at the moment, but pray that you will enter his heart and mind and that he may really know who he is, who's he, who he belongs to, and that you will bless him, Lord. And do be with and strengthen Pat, I pray, as well. And then we pray, too, that you will be with others, Lord. We pray that you will really reach out to them. We thank you for them. We thank you that those that may be at home now, watching us and listening to us, may they be blessed today, Lord, we pray. So do help us together now, Lord. Thank you for the glorious weather you've been sending us over past months, particularly down here in Kent. And we pray that you will shine down upon us now with your spirit, that we may be warmed, our hearts may be set on fire, and that you will really give Peter that strength as he speaks this morning. Lord, may there be power in everything that takes place to know that you are there with us and to bless us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I also just mention before I go that um, our son-in-law, Darren, uh, who you, many of you know has been in hospital this week and has had an operation. Um, we do, he came home, or he's come back out of hospital yesterday and he's at the moment with his mum and dad convalescing. So, we pray that you will continue to pray for him, Lord, and particularly for the children, Lucy and Nam, who I believe must wonder what's going on in, in their lives at the moment. They lost a mum last year, and now their dad's been very poorly, but we do think of them. Pray for them, please. And we pray that in due time we may be able to go down there uh, at least and see them. Well, I think we're going to have another song now. I think it is... The love songs from heaven. And then after that, Peter will... Is that no, correct? It, it's me next. Oh, sorry. You... It's fine. I know you'll sing next. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm in sort of a, a rush to uh, get here this morning to be at the front. It's just lovely to see you. Um, Although I need a telescope for some uh, sitting way at the back there, it is just so good to be together, isn't it, in this way. 
and we're looking that the Lord would bless us. Do turn to the passage that Chris only read a few moments ago, which is Revelation and chapter 4. If you're using a church Bible, it's 1236, page 1236 in a church Bible. Now, I want to ask a question straight away, so we're continuing Stephen's quiz in a way, and I want to just show you a slide up here, and if you're under 30, you may not know um, who this is, this cartoon, but if you're 30 and above, you probably will. Anyone like to tell me what this cartoon strip was a ball at? Nathan? Peanuts. You see, I just thought that you wouldn't know that because Peanuts was a wonderful cartoon strip in newspapers and it went from uh, 1950 right the way through to 2000. But then it stopped because the uh, author of Peanuts, uh, a man named Schultz, he died in the year 2000. But I'm amazed. Perhaps it's still around. I, I don't know. It's a wonderful cartoon, and many of you will remember it. It had some very interesting young children involved. In fact, adults, sorry adults, you never appeared. Uh, or very, very rarely. It was always children. Anyone remember the names of these people? Charlie Brown, rather a hapless young man, wasn't he? He always got things wrong. What about the dog? Snoopy, excellent, yes. And anyone else, do you remember? Oh, I'm amazed. There was always the rather uh, clever one who gave Charlie Brown a lot of hard time. That was Lucy. Do you remember Lucy and Linus? Uh, and I think there was even a pianist named Schroeder. And he was the intellectual and the artistic one. It was a fabulous uh, set of uh, cartoons that went on. Do you know, there were 355 million people, no, sorry, three, yes, 355 million people reading that cartoon every time it came out. And they reckon something like 75 countries actually printed it. So it was a really famous famous cartoon. The reason it's up there really is that the thing about the cartoon, although it was very silly and funny, a lot of people recognized that it actually spoke into real life and it sort of resonated with what we experience ourselves. So that's what fascinated people. In fact, there was a man named, I think, Robert Short and he was a Christian man and he used to do talks and lectures and he used to use peanuts as his illustrations. In fact, he wrote a book, and some of you may, older ones like me, remember it. It was called The Gospel According to Peanuts. And it was quite a clever book. I didn't agree with all of what he said, actually, but it was quite clever. Why am I talking about Peanuts this morning and the cartoons? Some of you children know cartoons much better than me. And the reason is that the thing about Peanuts was, as I say, it resonated with real life. That's what made it most interesting. And as we come to the book of Revelation, particularly now as we move into chapter 4 and onwards, that we only read a moment ago, we enter into a strange world, don't we? Let's be honest. And we have all sorts of images and things that are just hard for us to grasp and understand. Can I just say to you, and don't get me wrong in me saying this, that in a way, the book of Revelation from chapter 4 onwards is something of a cartoon. Now what I mean by that is this, that what we're looking at in these uh, images is not a photograph of reality. What we're looking at, as it were, is cartoons or images or symbols. But here's the difference. Although we can think of it as a cartoon in picture form, a cartoon might resonate with reality, but actually, of course, it's fiction. But when we look at the book of Revelation, even the strange things we may read in the book of Revelation, it is real. It may be a symbol, but it is a symbol of reality. It's, if I may say, true truth. It is absolute truth. Do you get it? 
I don't want you to go away thinking that I'm talking of Revelation as a fiction. I'm far away from that. It is true, but it is a picture of truth, not, as it were, a photograph. The second thing I want us to know as we begin this section, and I'm doing this in a way and as a sort of introduction, is that I always take the approach when I read Revelation that although it may be strange to us in the 21st century, I believe it wasn't to the people who read it in the early Christian church, that it worked with them. They understood it. They could interpret it in a way much more easily than we can. And I think it's important to begin there, to realize that it's not there to confuse the church of Jesus Christ for centuries, but actually to explain things. And the early Christians could understand these symbols much, much better than we. The third thing, really, I want to say about it is that it's what Jesus had to say at the beginning of the book at the beginning of this letter, if you remember, from Jesus through John to you and me. And this is what he says in chapter 1, verses 1 through to 3. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Do you get it? When we go through these chapters of Revelation, and some of them are going to be pretty difficult and pretty hard to understand, if we end our sermons and our time together without being blessed, without hearing the voice of the Lord Jesus, to put it, uh, to make a point, to actually feel it's been good to read this book and it's been good to hear it preach, then we have failed. The whole point of Revelation is that the church of Jesus Christ, every time it is read, every time it is preached and looked at, should be a blessing. We should leave that chapter or book or whatever it is we're reading at the time feeling that the Lord has been with us and he's taught us something. Not only taught us, but he has blessed us. Let's look straight away then at our first point, really. And that is the perspective from earth. Earth's perspective. I think you agree with me and we've prayed and thought already this morning that we're still in the midst of this pandemic and we seem to take one step forward and three back and we just don't know what the future holds. We begin to wonder, you know, whether our own nation has lost the plot really, that we don't really know where we're going and where all this is going to end. And maybe you feel individually, because we're in a strange environment even this morning. It's lovely to be together. It's I can't tell you how lovely it is to stand here and see real people. While I've been uh, recording my sermons, the only thing I've seen is myself. And it's been terrifying. uh, But you're terrifying, but not as terrifying as I am. So it's just lovely to see you. But maybe you individually, and those who are watching online, you may be feeling that you've lost the plot. You've no idea what life is any longer like and where it's going for you. Well, look, let's remind ourselves that when this letter from Jesus Christ landed on the churches, particularly in Asia Minor at the end of the first century, they must have been feeling that they'd lost the plot. They were living, remember, in this vast Roman Empire, this all-powerful empire. They were under the heel of various emperors, one after another. Some of them, let's face it, were psychopaths, were dangerous men. And they were also living in a time when these emperors, whatever they were doing and whatever they were like, were being worshipped. The emperor worship was very widespread. In fact, they would say, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to their emperor. That's what they would pray. And in fact, if you look at the chapter 4, you'll see that is an image, a pattern, 
that we see in verse 11 where the angels and the 24 elders cry out, you are worthy, our Lord and God. So there's a mirror image, but it's the emperor that they're talking about. So they're living in this Roman Empire, and life was fragile. It was difficult, because that Roman Empire could turn vicious, and would certainly crush Christians if it thought it could and needed to. So life was precarious for Christians in the first century. Not only were they subject to persecution, but also... They were in an age when um, the pandemics were common. Plague was common. And not only plague, but disease was very much part of everyday life. They lived in that sort of world, which seems to us so strange as we've been going through something like that. That was common for Christians in the first and second century and so on. And not only that, they were living not only in the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire was not always secure. And people in Asia Minor, particularly present-day Turkey, were subject to invasion by what they called the barbarians, uh, people of the Middle East. And so life was extremely difficult. And have you thought about it this way? That by the time this letter from the Lord Jesus arrives on these churches... It's been over 60 years since the Lord Jesus has gone to heaven, since his resurrection and ascension. And during that time, all the apostles are dead, except John. And he is a political prisoner on this rugged island of Patmos. So the apostles have gone. And the coming of the Lord Jesus, which they were so anxious to see, hadn't happened. They must have felt, just where is the plot line in our life anymore? And maybe that's where we feel this morning. Let's be honest. We wonder as Christians, just where are we going as the church of Jesus Christ, even in this land? We're seeing our own land just slip into the darkness, aren't we? We're seeing decisions made in Parliament which are so unbiblical, so dreadful. And in fact, one day we will rue the day for some of those decisions, I am convinced. And yet they are being embraced by the general population. We're seeing, in other words, our country entering into moral declension, really, which is happening so rapidly. We just wonder whether this nation has lost the plot. And we feel it too. Uh, I don't know what you're experiencing, those who are at home this morning. uh, We have no idea what each of us are knowing and experiencing. And maybe we feel that fragility that those early Christians felt. The danger of being a Christian is going to increasingly be the case for us. And we just wonder, you know, where is this all going? Where are we heading? But that's Earth's perspective, isn't it? And the point about the book of Revelation, it takes us from earth. Where to? Heaven. And that's what happens in our first two verses. After this I looked, says John, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So we move from the perspective of earth, which can be so depressing and so bewildering for all of us. But that's not where Jesus wants to leave his church. He wants to move us now into the perspective of heaven. And that's what we're going to see in the remaining of this chapter. But we're going to sing first. The uh, the song that Chris was so anxious for us to sing a moment ago, we're going to sing it. Could I suggest that, um, although I say we sing it, people who are actually watching online, you can sing really heartily. We're not allowed to, um, but we can stand. Let's do that.
Well, we, our song has said, hasn't it, love songs from heaven. And that's what the Lord Jesus is now doing for his church as we enter into chapter 4. It's as though he opens the door. In fact, that's what John sees, a door into heaven through which he passes. It's the, the curtain is being drawn aside a little bit for us all to see heaven in all its glory. So we read again verse 1 and 2. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. What do you think is the main point of those first two verses? that Jesus wants to leave with his church for them to remember. It's just one word. Could be anything, really. I'm being difficult here. Who's going to launch in? What's the word? Well, someone muttered, but... Yes. Throne. The word that stands out is the word throne and someone sitting upon it. In fact, seven times in the first six verses, the word throne appears. Look at it with me. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once... I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald, encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders, and they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. And also, in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Do you get it? When you see a repetition like that in Scripture, take note of it, because God is saying something he wants you to recognize and to remember. It is a throne. Now, this should not take any of us who've been following our sermons so far, even in the, the book of uh, the Psalms that we've been doing, that there is a throne in heaven. And seated upon the throne in heaven is God himself. That is so important. Imagine what that meant for the early Christians. In all the bewilderment and insecurity and fear that they were living in, just as it may be for you and me, that there is a throne in heaven. How often the, the Bible emphasizes this fact, that our God is in heaven on the throne, that he is the one in charge. Caesar is not in charge. He's not on the throne of the universe. And interestingly, neither are we, although we think we are sometimes. God is on the throne. And that's what the Lord Jesus wants us to remember straight away as an encouragement to us. The whole of heaven, as it were, revolves around this throne. As you read through chapter 4, everything is focused upon the throne in heaven. And all the worship is there. And there is glory, isn't there, that the Lord Jesus reveals to John in order for him to bring it to us. The glory of heaven, this symbolic picture form of heaven that we see uh, laid out before us. And did you notice that in the glory of heaven, it is Trinitarian? I don't know whether you spot that in, the, in this chapter, uh, or even in these first verses. But we have John, who we are told in verse 2, at once I was in the Spirit, capital S. But also, just um, as we read in verse 5, in front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. And we know this number seven has to do with perfection. 
You and I are going to have to hang in there with our mathematics, I'm afraid. One or two of our youngsters here are much better at it than we are. But in Revelation, it's full of numbers. And all those numbers mean something. It doesn't matter if we remember that now. You will by the end of chapter 22. But at the moment, we've got to remember that seven is perfection. It is the sevenfold, as I think our margin says, Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God. So we have the Lord Jesus who brings John into heaven in a vision. And we have the Spirit of God around the throne. And we have, of course, God the Father sitting on that throne. And the worship of heaven uh, is all to do with him, the, the Trinity of God, the fact of our Father, our Son, and Holy Spirit. And we have specific worship. And this is where we start to run into some difficulty, don't we? Look at verse 6b. In the center, round the throne, the throne again, you see, were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and behind. And the first living creature was like a lion, and the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had his six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And those of you who know your Bible know that takes us right back to the book of Isaiah and chapter 6. Okay, so here we are with four living creatures, all with six wings and four faces, and they, there were four faces that were looking at us, all with different images. What on earth is that about? Well, when we come to the number four, and you'll see this through the book of Revelation, it's usually talking about the earth. That shouldn't be that remote to us. Often when we talk about the earth, we talk about the four points of the compass, don't we? So we think the four points of the compass covers the whole earth. And that's what's happening here. That we have an image here of earth, of creation. And all of creation, think of this, in heaven, is crying out in praise to God. That the whole of created beings, under the sea, above the sea, in the sky, human beings are giving praise to God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That shouldn't seem strange to us. If you know your Psalms, you'll see that often in the Psalms, that's the way it talks. It talks of the trees clapping their hands. It has that sort of imagery, doesn't it? Hebrew does that. This wonderful poetic imagery. And that's what we have here. So we have the whole earth, as it were, the whole of creation, praising God on the throne. But there's something else here. What's the business of these faces? The first living creature was like a lion, and the second was like an ox, and the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Why, why do we have that? detail just to confuse us and make us wonder what these creatures looked like. Well, for a first century Christian and in the early years of Christianity, that wouldn't have been so strange. Why? Because the image of beasts particularly often denoted kingdoms and empires. It does today. When we talk of Russia, what is the beast that links with Russia? The bear. Absolutely. I hope those who do answer these questions pick up their sweeties at the end um, because uh, I don't want you to go without. There are not many left, I have to say. The bear. What about... Uh, you're going to get this one wrong, I think. What about the United Kingdom? What's the beast for the United Kingdom? The lion. Absolutely. Well done, Adam. Yeah, the lion. And what was the image of ancient Rome? Sorry? Yeah, the eagle. And so when you look at these uh, beings, these creatures, it's not so remote as you think. There's an image here of kingdoms. There's an image here 
uh, of sometimes tyrannical kingdoms and empires. And it's saying to John and then to us that look, in the end, all these kingdoms will worship God, whether they want to or not. They will have to admit that God is holy, 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 and he is almighty. That all these uh, empires will stand at the throne of God and have to worship him as he should be worshipped. And that every tyrant on earth, uh, and, and every king, and every queen, um, will have to worship God in the end. That's what it's saying. These creatures resembling these empires, these mighty empires. You think of the dictators in our world today. They will stand before the throne one day and have to give glory to God as he is and as he deserves. Now think how that would have encouraged the church of Jesus Christ. That there is a throne in heaven. You don't know what the end is going to be. You and I don't even know what's going to happen by the end of this coming week. But God does. We're not in control of anything, really. But God is. There is nothing outside of him. He holds the levers of control and of power of the universe. Nothing happens without his say-so. And for his children, that is particularly so. As his love surrounds us. We can be sure, and I think Stephen said that, didn't he, in the early part of the service, that he is in control. Nothing can happen to his people without his permission. And so we have here in this sense of heaven, this glory and this majesty, and we are joining in with that as the whole of the universe worships God. So we have the heavenly perspective. But lastly... We have our Christian perspective. When I read this chapter, I felt there was a, a problem that we could fall into very easily. And that is that as we read the majesty and the glory and the wonder of God, which just chapter 4 brings to us, and there's more to come, it can almost push us away, can't it? It can also it almost make us feel that God is distant. That somehow all of that's true, and it's good to have that truth, but it's just truth. And, uh, and that's going to help, I hope. But in a sense, this chapter can make us feel, well, we're very small, and God is up there, and we're down here. And even uh, just verse 5, from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Well, what is that a picture of? Well, it's Sinai, isn't it? And what happened at Sinai is the mountain shook and the glory of God descended upon the mountain. The people were terrified. They stood at the bottom of the mountain and had to stand at a distance. They were so afraid that their lives would be consumed by the presence of God. So we have that here. And so the image can be that God is out there somewhere and we're here and he is so glorious and we're so weak and small and sinful well, all of that's true, but that's not what's being said in chapter 4. Do you notice it? Do you know how the Lord Jesus wants to encourage his church this morning? Well, we can see it in verse 2 and 3. Or rather, we'll go from verse 3 and verse 4. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. Here is glory. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. And surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. And they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. Well, here we are again. Now we've got 24 elders. Who are these? Are they the elite of the church? And uh, they've got a special place in heaven because they're elite. They are Elders? Well, of course not. The whole point of that image there is of the church of Jesus Christ. The complete church of Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Well, 12, another number, 12 is a complete number. In the Bible, you can't add to it or subtract. 24 is 2 times 12. 
what we have is the 12 tribes of Israel, Old Testament saints, and the 12 apostles in the New Testament representing the church of Jesus Christ. And so we have 24. What is that? The Old Testament church and the New Testament church is gathered together complete. It is everyone who belongs to the church is there. That's what this is saying. And so we have these elders who are you and me, Christians, all gathered to the throne. And who are they? Well, they're the ones who know what it is to have the covenant promises of God. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. We have that picture there, don't we, of Noah's day, where God promised covenanted with his people that he would never judge the world again with a complete flood, that he would never flood the earth again in completion like that. That's a covenant promise. We have the New Testament rainbow, as it were, where we look to the cross and hear the same promise that those of us who are trusting in Jesus and his work upon the cross have his promise that there is no judgment. When we stand before a throne, we think of judgment but not for the church of Jesus Christ. We stand before the throne and it is not for judgment. We are those who have been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus as one of the chapters brings to us in the coming days. We're those who know the promise of God that there is no judgment for God's people, that we are safe in Jesus Christ. And these people, look, they're surrounding the throne. Seated on them were 24 elders, and they were dressed in white, the righteousness of Jesus. We don't take anything of our righteousness into heaven, do we? Our righteousness is, at its best, corrupt. We're sinful. We're dirty. But when we enter into the heavens... We're going to be wearing the righteousness of Christ. That's what's happening here. And they have crowns of gold on their heads. It's something I find difficult to get my head around, but the Bible tells us that when we reach heaven, we will reign with Jesus. He will share his sovereign reign with his people. We will sit with him on his throne. Do you remember the end of the letter to the Laodicean church, verse 23, just the previous chapter? To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. There is this sense that God's people will be reigning upon the throne. But listen, something very important here is that as we enter into the heavens and see all this glory, we can miss the point that the nearest to the throne is the church of Jesus Christ. They're the ones that are mentioned first, aren't they? And so, we will be part of the glory of heaven, but somehow we will be the nearest to the throne because we are his beloved people. We are the ones who the heart of Christ has reached out to. I would put it this way. It's not so much that these 24 elders sat near the throne. They sat near the heart of Jesus. And the loving heart of Jesus enfolds his people for eternity. There's something very strange about this um, vision. Well, you probably think there's more than one thing that's strange. And what is strange is that John sees 12 apostles sitting near the throne. But John isn't dead yet. He's still on the Isle of Patmos. Why is that? Because he knows he may be on this terrible island where these prisoners, political prisoners, for him, because he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, are worked to death. The one day, John, you're going to be there. And it's as certain as this vision. You will be sitting there by the throne. 
And if you and I are trusting in Christ this morning, and in no other thing, and no other person, well, believe this or not, you and I will be sitting by that throne as well. Not one of us will be lost because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will join in with the elders. Verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns. Well, of course they do. These have been gifted by the Lord Jesus. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And one day we'll be singing that song as well. Well, we can't sing this morning. Don't you feel the loss of that? But those at home can sing as loud as they wish and as loud as their neighbors will tolerate. But we're going to sing about the fact that when we uh, face these things in this world, that when I am weary with the cost, I see the triumph of the cross. So in its shadow, I shall run till you complete the work begun. Let's stand to sing or not.
Do sit down. Stephen mentioned about Sir Tom Moore. He said this, I am absolutely overawed by the fact that this is such a high award from Her Majesty as well. It's been an absolutely magnificent day for me. Asked how it compared to the thrill of raising 33 million, he said, the money will be useful, but there's only one queen. To get a message from the queen, there's no value that can be placed on that. To meet the queen was more than anyone could expect. Never ever did I imagine that I should get so close to the queen. Just think one day, you and I, if we trust in Christ, will be closer than Sir Tom ever was to the Queen. We will be close to God in his presence and in the embrace of our precious Saviour. Lord our God, we thank you for this morning, for the way we've been able to gather as strange as it feels. Help it not to be strange in the coming weeks, but something that we are anxious to see and do, and in all of it to glorify you. Lead us through, Lord, in our worship. Lead us in our reading of this difficult text so often in Revelation that it will not only be explained to us, that we may understand, but that we may be moved in our hearts and lives as we face the coming days. Hear our prayer for one another in Jesus' name. Amen. Hillary needs just to say something about refreshments. Thank you, Hillary. Just a thought came through my head there, and um, forgive me for this, but I just saw my mum laying her crown at the feet of Jesus um, with Joe and with Ken, and uh, it was a bit overwhelming, really, but there you go. Right, on to matters. Um, can I just say, kids, how well you have done at the back there? Thank you so much. Absolutely brilliant. Um, We've operating a one-way system, um, and I've already said that. So when you want to leave the building, will you go out of the fire door in the second hall? So through the one-way system and out of the fire door in the second hall. Um, and if you want to sit at a table and be served, we're just going to wipe those tables down, and you can sit down and have your coffee there. Uh, if you'd rather queue and stand, then can you go to the left hatch? If you want to eat, uh, sit at the table, go to the right hatch and, or sit at the table and they'll serve you from the right hatch. Everybody's got masks and gloves on. And just remember this lovely measurement of two metres as you meet together. Thank you very much. God bless you.